Forget ancient myths or legends. Life, in scientific terms, can be boiled down simply to chemical reactions. If the right environmental conditions arise, life will spontaneously evolve. This Artemisia annua, sweet wormwood, a Chinese medicinal herb, here, grown in a laboratory. The herb has gained an international reputation, saving lives around the world and winning China's first Nobel Prize in medicine. Tu Youyou was the scientist who led the team, which isolated the drug artemisinin from within the natural herb in the 1970s. It has become a key part of the treatment for malaria and has saved millions of lives. In 2015, Tu Youyou was awarded the Nobel Laureate Prize in Medicine for her work. Life sciences is a growing field in China and attracting attention from around the world. The 21st century has been predicted to be the century of life sciences. Technological breakthroughs in genetics, bioengineering, medical imaging, microsurgery, and food sciences all promise extended longevity and improved quality of life. China is pursuing super crops, immune the vagaries of weather, pests, and disease. Some of these ideas sound like pure science fiction, but it is a fiction that is already becoming a reality. In southern Guangzhou, Chemical spraying takes in most areas twice a week to suppress the mosquitoes and the diseases, like dengue fever, which they spread. Mosquitoes are the number one killer of human beings. Every year, 350 million people in the world are infected by mosquito-borne diseases. Nearly half a million die. The virus that causes dengue is spread to humans by the saliva of infected female mosquitoes. It is spread to the mosquitoes by the blood of infected humans. Professor Shi Zhiyong has a lab full of millions of mosquitoes. His research focuses on Aedes albopictus, a major carrier of dengue. There is no reliable vaccine for dengue, so mosquito suppression is the main control method. Chemical insecticides are the most direct anti-mosquito weapons, but these can have serious environmental effects. In addition, the mosquitoes themselves gradually develop resistance. Xi Zhiyong has a different plan, simply to prevent the infected females from laying viable eggs. In nature, up to 70% of insects naturally carry a bacterium called Wolbachia. In most cases, it lives in symbiosis with its hosts. In mosquitoes, it can help with viral resistance, making the insects less prone to become vectors of the disease.
Most strikingly, in Aedes autopictus and other mosquitoes, Wolbachia creates cytoplasmic incompatibility. That is, uninfected females cannot produce viable eggs if they mate with infected males. A female mosquito can lay eggs many times in its lifetime. Every time a wild uninfected female mates with a Wolbachia infected male, those 200 to 300 eggs will not hatch. It is a radically effective way of controlling mosquito numbers. Seventeen years ago, when Shi Zhiyong studied for his doctorate in the United States, he tried to establish a symbiotic relationship between mosquitoes and Wolbachia. However, while this was possible in theory, it had never been demonstrated in practice. Shi Zhiyong's work suffered constant interruptions. However, Shi Zhiyong was not put off. He spent nearly a year patiently polishing down quartz needles to a diameter thinner than a human hair. With this needle, he can operate directly on the mosquito eggs, which are less than one millimeter across in each dimension. Shi Zhiyong plans to extract Wolbachia bacteria from previously infected mosquito eggs and then inject it into the target eggs under the microscope. The temperature, pretreatment of eggs, the time and location of the injection all need to be precisely controlled. The slightest error or a broken needle tip will lead to failure. After breaking thousands of needles, injecting 100,000 mosquito eggs, a mosquito with inherent symbiotic Wolbachia is finally born. It is a man-made relationship. Shi Zhiyong's laboratory is now home to the world's largest mosquito breeding facility. It boasts world-renowned embryo injection technology and mass-produces mosquitoes with Wolbachia. The latest batch is destined for Shadzai Island, 50 kilometers away. Shadzai Island covers an area of three square kilometers. Every week for the last two years, 20 million male mosquitoes have been released here. The mosquito count on the island is now just 10% of that in the surrounding areas. At this level, the risk of diseases like dengue becomes negligible. The World Health Organization has recently taken this technology to the wider world. Professor Xi's mosquitoes have introduced a new epidemic prevention and treatment program to the 3.9 billion people living in dengue endemic areas. Life sciences have two main goals, the maintenance of human health and the provision of food. Food security has always been a priority in a densely populated nation like China. Faced a large population and limited agricultural land, scientists have turned to biotechnology to create the crops which can feed the Chinese people in the future. In early June, the wheat ripens.
Never in the past have crops grown here in such an abundance. But from the air, we can see that the fields are remarkable for more than just their prodigious yields. They are encircled by a moat where shrimps are farmed in seawater. The fields used to be salt marsh. In a salt marsh, the pressure of seawater raises the groundwater level. The soil sucks the water with high salt content to its surface. After the surface water evaporates, the salt is left in the soil. This harsh environment made it difficult to grow food. Ouyang Zhu, a native of Guangdong in the deep south, has lived in the wheat fields of northern China for 30 years. His life's mission has been in growing crops in impossible places. Only 13% of China's land area is suitable for growing foodstuffs. The annual importation of vegetables and grain is equivalent to cultivating another 400,000 square kilometers of arable land. It is imperative to find as much land as possible. The transformation of saline alkali land is one of the key steps. In the 1980s, a large number of researchers from different fields gathered on the Huanghuaihai Plain Wo Yang Zhu was one of them. After 20 years' work, they successfully reclaimed more than 20,000 square kilometers of saline alkali land. It is a miraculous achievement, but it has also left a historical problem. This is a corner of the reclaimed coastal marshland. There is still no life here. Normally, extracting the groundwater with high salt content is an effective way to improve the saline alkali land. But this method does not work by the sea. This area of saline alkali land next to the coast is like a huge sponge, providing an unimpeded access channel for groundwater. It has been a problem for these 30 years. However, an ingenious idea is emerging in a factory 200 kilometers away. Liu Changsheng is a partner of Ouyang Zhu. This hole is closed. The people who this place call it a mouth bar. Liu Changsheng's team has come up with the secret weapons to transform saline alkali land. Compared with the huge work seen 30 years ago, the tool for the transformation is a creature invisible to the naked eye. The microorganisms are measured in micrometers, Carefully nurtured, they thrive in harsh conditions of saline alkali soil. Their metabolic cycle gradually cements soil material into a granular structure, which blocks the ascending saltwater channels. The land above becomes safe for crops. In the bleakest situations, life begets life. This breakthrough has empowered the full use of the land. The goal now is to transform all the saline alkali land in the sea level plain around the Bohai Sea. This is 30-year large-scale agricultural science and technology project. In 2020, the area will contribute 5 million tons of grain to China's food needs. 
The experience has also provided valuable lessons in the transformation of saline alkali land for agricultural development. Soil improvement is part of the story. The real success is down to the dreams and persistence of those who believed in the project and carried it through. While some dedicate themselves to the remote and wild places on this earth, others focus on the urban jungle. This is the mega city of Beijing. It has a population of over 20 million. Every day they consume around 20,000 tons of vegetables. In an urban area with high land prices, it is near impossible to find the land on which to grow vegetable economically. But transporting vegetables from afar also has its problems. Transport costs, food miles, and the problem of maintaining the product at peak freshness and quality all become contentious factors which need to be balanced out. Is there another way? This is a vegetable kingdom. Everything grows without need for light from the sun. Specialized lamps provide the red and blue light needed for plant photosynthesis. A carefully made soup of nutrient allows the plants to grow without soil. This also means their beds can be stacked vertically, greatly reducing the ground area required for the same level of production. All year-round planting means that yields here can reach 100 times that of the same area of planted soil. This type of plant factory is now moving from the laboratory into the real world. Outside Beijing 6th Ring Road, over 40 kilometers from the city center, fresh butterhead lettuce are ready for harvesting. The technology used is hydroponics. Under intelligent control, from sprouting to harvesting, the whole process takes less than three weeks. Three managers can run the entire 200 square meter factory. Just like the flow line production of industrial products, vegetables are produced in batches within a specified time. E-commerce platforms allow consumers to purchase them directly from the producer. Fresh vegetables delivered to customers' homes within six hours of picking. In the future, a few skyscrapers could be enough to provide fresh vegetables for an entire city. China is one of the countries leading the world in developing this possibility. If life sciences are the key to the 21st century, China is blessed with a number of advantages. It has the world's largest human population and spans almost all types of terrain and climatic changes from the tropical to the tundra. This means it has an extraordinary variety of species, which makes for a genetic treasure trove. In the Dapeng New District of Shenzhen, great ambitions are fermenting in a huge modern building. In its 120,000 square meters, it aims to accommodate the all species of the world, not necessarily as living creatures, but encoded in digital form. It is China National Gene Bank in Shenzhen. All living creatures have genes. They are DNA or RNA sequences with genetic information. The DNA inside cells exists in a double helix structure. 
on its two long chains are hundreds of millions of base pairs. There are only four types of bases marked by scientists with four letters, namely A, T, C, and G. It is their arrangement that records all the secrets of life. A machine called a gene sequencer extracts DNA from cells and makes it into a biochip. The biochips are then put into the sequencer. The sequencer translates the samples on the biochips into a sequence arranged in streams of the four base letters. The center has 150 sequencers working around the clock. It holds the world's largest comprehensive genetic data bank. These sequences are the specifications for life. Deciphering them will help us treat disease, resurrect extinct species, and breed super crops. Gao Caixia of the Chinese Academy of Sciences is an expert on the wheat plant. She is a master in plant breeding. In days gone by, breeding experts joked that they were just farmers with salaries. Now they are more likely to see themselves as crop designers because they control the genes of plants like fashion designers or tailors. No matter how complicated and diverse the styles and details are, most clothes design is done by cutting and sewing. Now the same is true to the wheat that Gao Caixiao works on. This wheat is infected with powdery mildew. Being vulnerable to the disease is a feature of wheat varieties. The different traits of plants are determined by their genomes. The fact that wheat is susceptible to powdery mildew is related to a sequence of letters in its genome. If these can be identified and altered or eliminated, the threat of the disease may also be able to be eliminated. Professor Gao must find tools that can be used to modify the gene chain. At the beginning of the 21st century, a new technology was invented, gene editing. Scientists cut the helix strands at specific points in the DNA sequence to remove a fragment or insert a different fragment, thus changing the organism's characteristics. Whether and how gene editing will work in practice has sent laboratories around the world into a frenzy of competition. In the gene era, if you want to come up with something new, you need to be fast. This is a completely new technique. Wheat has more than 300,000 genes. Only three of wheat's genes relate to disease vulnerability. Gene editing is like finding a needle in a haystack. It relies on skill, experience, and plain old luck. 
but in theory, it puts mankind in the realm of the creator. In 2015, Gao Caixia's team used gene editing to create a wheat with resistance to powdery mildew. It was a world first in tackling the problem. Their paper on the subject was selected by a leading international academic journal as one of the 20 most valuable since it began publication. Over the past two decades, China has become a world leader in scientific innovation as measured through patents registered. There is another area in which Chinese scientists have been trying to lead the way into the future with the most cutting-edge technologies. It is a kind of magic that uses time. These are cells magnified up to 100 microns under the microscopes. The cells are from the tails of adult mice, but have been reprogrammed to give them the potential to develop into any type of organ or tissue within the mouse's body. The same could be done with humans. Stem cells are capable of transforming themselves into any of the body's specialized organ, tissue, or bone cells, allowing the body to repair itself. In 2006, Japanese scientists succeeded in creating induced pluripotent stem cells from human skin cells. Their pioneering work accelerated research on stem cell technologies around the world. Stem cell therapies have given rise to a new field of regenerative medicine. In early 2000, Pei Duanqing, who had studied cancer in the United States, chose to return to China and set up a team into a new area of research, stem cells. However, Pei Duanqin felt there was a problem using skin cells. As skin is exposed to sunlight, this could cause genetic mutation and affect the quality of stem cells. So where could Pei's team find a reliable and abundant source of easily accessible stem cells? Pei Duanqing's solution might seem outlandish to some. A small bottle of urine opened a new world. Pei Duanqing's team implanted the stem cells induced from the urine into mice. The mice grew teeth. These teeth were less than one millimeter in diameter, but had human genes. This achievement attracted worldwide attention. I 
能起步是很晚很晚的。但是我们科学家们很努力，敢于想大家啊还没想到的问题。The exploration of stem cells is not just a game played in an ivory tower. At present, China has the largest number of elderly people in the world. Aging is the root cause of organ failure or neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Incurable diseases impose great suffering on patients and a heavy burden for their families. Stem cell research brings new hope for tackling issues that cannot be solved by existing medical treatment. Now Pei's team has taken an even bolder step to try to make liver tissue outside the human body with the pluripotent stem cells obtained from urine. This is why I wanted to do the eye. I said I want to do the eye. Definitely, the skin cell will help the development of the eye. 帮助作用，因为它这科学规律都是一样的。The human body has 200 trillion cells, and the induced pluripotent stem cells may differentiate into any one of them. How to make them grow into a specific organ and be used in clinical treatment is as complicated as the moon landings were in their time. 我觉得中国肯定是在世界的最前沿，在这个领域里面，大家知道的我们也全知道，大家不知道的我们也不知道，前面也没有路了，那就是在各自在探索。Regenerative medicine offers the promise of rebuilding damaged organs and tissue, sometimes from injections of stem cells, sometimes by transplant of organs grown in vitro. One month ago, Ahwe accidentally fell from a great height and seriously damaged his spinal cord. Records from ancient Egypt describe spinal cord injuries as incurable. The nerves in the spinal cord are the key link between the brain and the body's peripheral nervous system. Seriously injury can result in paralysis below the site of the damage. Once damaged, it cannot be regenerated, making the paralysis permanent. In China, there are more than two million people affected by this, but it is a worldwide problem. Dai Jianwu is a medical researcher who spends a lot of time visiting hospitals. His research focuses on diseases that are complicated and difficult to cure. We've done a lot of things that nobody has done, including some of our patients in the hospital. We've done a lot of things that nobody has done. For example, a few years ago, many people told me not to touch it. They said, this is too difficult, you should not waste time. It's a waste of time. However, Dai Jianwu is not interested in such negative thinking. If spinal nerves cannot regrow on their own, what material can we introduce to the damaged area to help it heal? Sometimes wounds or organs can be repaired by the use of an extracellular matrix around which new cells can grow. Bones, joints, teeth, and blood vessels are all amenable to reconstruction or regenerative treatments based on tissue engineering and stem cell biology. To treat spinal nerve damage, stem cells seem to hold the key. 
However, there has been a long-standing technical problem which has held up progress. A stent that is compatible with spinal cord nerve tissue is required, and hitherto, such material has not existed. Dai Jianwu's team may have found an answer. This vermicelli-like material is a kind of synthetic collagen. They are extruded from a superfine nozzle in linear fiber bundles. The size of the nozzle determines the diameter of the collagen strand. When composed into bundles, these strands will form a substrate compatible with the spinal tissue on which the stem cells can grow in order to repair the damaged section of cord. Fourteen days after his accident, Ahui undergoes surgery to his spinal nerve damage. Dai Jianwu's team are on hand to assist the surgeons with the new biomaterial stent. Ahui has an 8mm gap in his spinal cord, which needs to be bridged. The collagen stent must be made on site. The length of the stent must slightly exceed the length of the cavity in the spinal cord. Then the stem cells can be introduced. The stem cells are injected into the cavity in the spinal collagen. After that, the collagen stent is inserted. Now it is a question of time to see when the stem cells can reconnect the damaged nerves. Hai Long was the first patient in the hospital to undergo this type of operation. Several months on his spine has recovered enough to allow him to stand up. The hope that this new technique is bringing to patients is inestimable. Investment in research on regenerative medicine and tissue engineering in China has already reached billions of yuan. Ambitions are high for the future, with some of the nation's best medical minds dedicated to developing it further. It is estimated that by 2020, China will be the world's second largest market for biomaterials, making up nearly a quarter of global market share. These pioneers of modern scientific medicine hold our future in their hands. The scientific method has revolutionized our understanding of life. Yet, for all that it has achieved, this is just a beginning. What the future will bring is still beyond our dreams. We can't predict what scientists will discover, but the motivation for their work is very clear. Tree shrew is used to study viruses, for which the world does not yet have a cure. To understand the workings of the human brain, even mice can serve as our teachers. Sometimes to stimulate a better understanding of life on Earth, you have to look outside of our planet. This unprepossessing looking institute has, in the 10 years since it opened, attracted some of the top scientific talent in China and the world. 
It is the National Institute of Biological Sciences in Beijing. <laughs> Li Wenhui used to be one of the top virologists in Harvard Medical School. He returned to China in 2006 to study a subject which had confounded scientists for decades, the nature of the liver cell receptors that allow hepatitis B infection. The problem had to be tackled from scratch. For five years, Li Wenhui barely published a paper. Beijing's National Institute of Biological Sciences continued to support him with sufficient funding and time. Wang Xiaodong is director of the National Institute of Biological Sciences in Beijing. It is his responsibility to encourage innovation. Wang Xiaodong has been at the National Institute of Biological Sciences for over a decade. The scientists here enjoy long-term financial support and are free to choose research topics that they consider important. Wang Xiaodong studied and taught in the United States for 25 years. At the age of 41, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. There were more than 200,000 Chinese students studying in the United States at the time. Wang Xiaodong was the first to enter this most prestigious of bodies in American science. Establishing a world-class life sciences research institute and bringing wisdom, vision, as well as belief back to their homeland has become a common choice for many overseas scientists like Wang Xiaodong. Wang <laughs> However, underpinning this freedom is a rigorous review mechanism. Every five years, their research results will be assessed anonymously by their international counterparts. Those who get a positive assessment can expect promotion. However, if they fail to do so, they will have to leave. The core criterion for evaluation is whether their work is leading in its field.
After five years, Li Wenhui found the protein which allows the hepatitis B virus to enter the liver. This breakthrough may end the misery caused by a disease which affects 343 million people worldwide and kills 750,000 every year. In 2015, 43-year-old Xiao Feng became the youngest academician of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. His research into the human immune system resulted in new drug treatments for life-threatening conditions like sepsis. Luo Minmin's research in neuroscience overthrew the mainstream theory that had held sway for 30 years and provided new ideas for the treatment of mental illness such as depression and schizophrenia. Since the establishment of the National Institute of Biological Sciences in Beijing, the number of papers published by Chinese researchers in the world's leading academic journals has grown very significantly. They all stand at the cutting edge of their field of study. China has become one of the global centers for science and technology. What kind of future lies before us? It is probably beyond our imagination. One thing is for sure, life sciences are evolving so rapidly that the myths and legends of old seem tame shadows of ignorance. A brilliant bright new future is taking shape before our eyes.